Hello there, listeners. I've got another exciting announcement for you guys. Perpetual Chess is joining the Blue Wire Podcast Network. Blue Wire is a fast-growing network of sports and lifestyle podcasts. I was already a fan of a few of their podcasts, so I was honored when they reached out to me about joining their network. As a chess fan, I also was happy to see that they are recognizing the increased popularity of chess by adding the first chess podcast to their team alongside NBA, NFL, comedy, and different lifestyle-type podcasts. Now they have a chess podcast in their network as well. Now, I want to be clear that nothing major is changing about Perpetual Chess. It's still my podcast, and editorially, there will be nothing different. Blue Wire will help with promotion so Perpetual Chess can reach a wider audience, and there will also be a few more non-chess ads in the podcast from this point forward, in addition to our chess sponsors like Chessable and Aim Chess. The Perpetual Chess Patreon community will remain vibrant, and in fact, Rook-level subscribers to Perpetual Chess will be offered an ad-free version of each Perpetual Chess episode. As for me personally, it's another step forward in the growth and viability of the Perpetual Chess podcast, so I just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has listened, supported, and appeared on the show along the way. It's great to see the chess community thriving, and I'm looking forward to many more years of continued growth. So having covered that announcement, I would like to get to the interview with the always entertaining James Altucher. Here we go. Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have a return guest that I am always happy to speak with. He is a best-selling author, including the new book, Skip the Line, a successful entrepreneur, a failed entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur again, a... Um, popular part podcaster in his own right. Uh, the James Altucher show, of course, um, comes out with new episodes all the time and is uh, quite popular. It's more of a business and self-improvement podcast, but he does do some chess. In fact, in the past year, he interviewed our friend Jen Shahadi about the Queen's Gambit boom, and he interviewed uh, some guy named Gary Kasparov about his new ventures. And in those interviews, as a listener of James's podcast, of course, I could detect that the glint in his eye about chess was back. That he was back into chess. He discussed his own playing. So I guess you could call him an adult improver, as we are going to discuss. So without further ado, let's welcome James Altucher back to the show. Hey, James. Ben, so excited to be here. I've been uh, really meaning to even talk to you offline about adult improvement just and and see what you were learning from all your excellent guests that you've been having. And then um, you reached out, and I'm so glad we could be talking on the podcast. Yeah, well, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're you're a busy man, but yeah, I'm excited too. I mean, I've become that like teacher who can't do because I spend my hour a day, you know, trying to get better at chess, an hour and a half if I'm lucky. And, you know, maybe I'm making moderate improvements, but compared to the adult improvers that I interview, um, I'm just not putting in the time uh, necessary to make the improvements I, w- I would like. And by well, the way, well- before... So, what what are you doing during that hour for the improvement? And I know you've learned a lot of tips talking to so many great people. I mean, a lot of I I have basically every guest you have that talks about adult improvement. I have their book. Yeah, that's great. They'll be glad to hear that. We got to support the chess content creators. And I'll answer your question. But one last thing I should have mentioned in the up in the intro: uh, James's first interview was way back in 2017, episode 42. So some of you listeners, it's a very entertaining episode. James has some great stories from his life. Uh, playing chess and other games, poker, backgammon. So you guys might want to check that out. If you're even if you know James's work but aren't familiar with his chess backstory, that could be some good background. Now, James, to your question for what I'm doing, I have that sort of classic uh, dad's dilemma, where I what I need to be doing is hard training. What I need to be doing is calculation work. Um, but there's always stuff going on in my house. Um, so often I'm reviewing opening lines on Chessable. I might do a tactics trainer. I play some blitz games. And of course, I read tons of chess books for this podcast, as you might guess, which sort of counts as training, sort of doesn't. But also, like, I don't give, the, give it the attention it deserves because that's always like one book after the another, another one author after another. 
So, you know, some of these books you could spend months reading, and I often don't have months with an episode coming out every month. So what I am doing is a little of this, a little of that. What I should be doing is like 90 minutes a day minimum of just straight up calculation training, in my opinion. That's so interesting. So because I always wonder about the relationship between uh, tactics and improvement, you know, and you have people like Anand always say, you know, chess is 99 percent tactics. I think I think that quote's been said by quite a few people, but I, I specifically remember uh, Anand saying it. And I don't know. Certainly studying tactics can't be bad for you, but is it the key to improvement at your level, for instance? Uh, or, or is it studying, you know, positional stuff or, you know, of course, getting good positionally, the, the outcome is that you convert your advantage using some tactical stuff. But uh, anyway, I, I've been working a lot on tactics as well. So I, but I've just been debating this. Yeah, for me, it's not necessarily like I've actually I was one of those like chess is all tactics people when I started doing this podcast and people like uh, I am Willie Hendricks when he talked about um, and and our friend Greg Shahadi when they talk about the fact that when you set out to learn openings, you actually will learn them, which is more than you can necessarily say about uh, calculation improvement and, you know, knowing the basic ideas of the position can save you time on the clock, which is something that maybe it's like harder to quantify, but is super important. So it's not necessarily that I think like everyone should be doing pure tactics, but I think I'm particularly weak at tactics for my level. I think like my positional understanding is pretty decent. My like uh, my like um, will to compete helps me, but just actual calculation could use some work. And since I play a lot of blitz, like I would like to be better at blitz too. Um, what about you? I, I know, by the way, we should mention James has mentioned he's been working with some coaches. He talked about his old coaches in our first interview, but more recently, I am Eric Rosen and now GM Jesse Cry, friends of the show both. Um, what else is going on study-wise with you, James? I think, so So basically, I've been doing this since November or December, where uh, kind of after the Queen's Gambit, actually. And, I, you know, for, for the past 25 years, I've been playing basically Blitz on ICC every day. And I think it's done nothing for my ability at all. Like it's just, it's probably crushed my ability. But the last time I studied chess seriously was in um, 1997 where John Fedorowicz was my coach then. And I spent a good, you know, probably six to eight months every day studying. And I was taking lessons three times a week. And we were mostly just going over opening variations, but it was good enough to get me from a rating of about, I think I started that period with a rating of about, 2050. And then, you know, my final rating in that period was 2204, but probably my strength, you know, your strength kind of leads your rating and probably my strength, strength for a brief period, uh, was around the 2300 level. But, you know, I, I started, I get, I think I got mid midway around 2240 and then it started slipping and I said, that's it. I'm not going to play anymore. <laughs> I'm not going to go below 2200, but now for the first time in like 24 years, I'm, I'm going to start playing in tournaments again. So I've been really I've been really working at it, maybe to the detriment of other aspects of my life. But as you know, chess is a beautiful game and it's, and it's worth it to me to to get better and, and know more. Yeah, I mean, it's great to hear as because you mentioned this in our previous interview that you you were at 2200 and you were just going to leave it there. And you even mentioned in your book, uh, your new book, Skip the Line, the fact that you're you know you don't get any appreciable benefits career wise or even like chess respect wise. Um, for playing at our level, like especially yours, since you're still over 2200, my rating has fallen below 2200. Um, but you're still going to put it out there. You're still going to risk it. So wh what led to that decision, James? Yeah. So, so first off, to mention, like the career benefits of being above 2200 are enormous because if anyone asks you, oh, are you a chess master? They don't know what that means, but at least you could truthfully say yes. <laughs> And so, you know, unless I, are you a life master? Did you have enough games above 2200? No, I'm just, just a national master was, was lucky to achieve that. So, uh, so like, you know, I guess if you're a life master, it doesn't matter your rating. You could say, yeah, I am. But, uh, I mean, the benefits are enormous in the outside chess world because whether they're correct or incorrect, and they're probably largely incorrect, although it's debatable, people think chess is correlated with intelligence and, uh, understanding, you know, you know, calculating the future. And so, so, you know, you always get interest from people who are in the financial business or 
I don't know. It's just like an impressive thing to, to people who are not really familiar with it or don't really know a lot of chess masters. And uh, uh, so I figured, okay, I'm going to stop at 2200. And the benefits were huge. I was, I was getting jobs. I got into undergrad and grad school and got jobs because of my rating or ranking. I've raised money for businesses in part because of my rating. It was just a useful thing. But now I, I'm really in it for the game. And what, what changed things was I realized, oh my gosh, not only have I not maintained my ability, I kind of suck now. Right. <laughs> and, I've been there. And, yeah. and, and not, not to criticize anybody who's working hard and who's rated lower. I'm saying I, I suck relative to how I was, or this is what I was saying to myself in November or December. I, I, I was really playing poorly relative to how I played when I was at my peak. And I realized that because I started taking it seriously and I stopped playing blitz on ICC, but I moved over to Lee chess. Uh, mostly I was playing on Lee chess and a little bit on chess.com. And, and I realized the entire chess world has changed. Even though I've probably been playing every day, when you take it seriously again and you look around, everything had changed. Like literally the openings people played, the way people studied, uh, you know, the, the, the things that were important to, to players who were improving and, and, and the entire, so not only do I, do I feel I was no longer at 2200 strength, even compared to how ratings were in, in the nineties, but the entire system was, everybody had improved so I think the average 2200 now is better than the average 2200 from 1997, which is when yeah. I hit 2200. Yeah, I and think so too. So, so like maybe I dropped from 2200 strength or a little stronger to 2100 strength, but then the world itself made me drop from the world improving made me drop from let's say 2100 to whatever, who knows what. And so I wanted to at least get back to where I was before, but then I realized that didn't even make any sense. Like there was no, there's no before, like the right. world has, has changed. Yeah. Like you, exactly. have to know, you have to know different things. Yeah. I always remember Alex Lenderman in one of the early interviews on this show said, if you're not getting, if you're not getting uh, better, you're getting worse. Like there, there is no standing still in chess. Yeah. And even if you try, like, like, even if you try to maintain whatever my strength was, Back in 1997, that wouldn't be necessarily a 2200 now, because I think in general, you know, because of the because of the the chess engines that you could look at, and also sites like Chessable and and uh, all sorts of tools now that, that you could have. A lot of people take lessons online and so on. You, really, the average 2200 knows a lot more than than I did then. Well, well, I wonder about this because, and you're older too. I mean, I'm 25 years older than when I last played in a tournament. And uh, I used to study primarily tactics and openings and I, and my memory was much better, or at least I think it was. So I knew openings like really well. And to some extent, the ideas behind the openings, but I really knew all the variations really well. I didn't know anything about end games and I would study tactics every day, but now I'm, I'm realizing it, let's say for a second, it's not age related, the decline in memory and decline in tactical ability. Not only do you have to kind of get up to speed again in openings after 25 years, because they've all changed. And, and not only do I have to get up to speed, you know, studying tactics, but I think you need a lot more positional understanding now than, than ever before, at least at the 2200 level, you need to know, you need to know positional and strategic chess and the, and ideas a lot more right now. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's nowhere to hide. I mean, you, everyone needs help everywhere. I def, definitely relate to that. So so what are you what are you doing, James? So how many hours a day, and what are you studying? Okay, so so I probably am doing about three four hours a day, seven wow. days a week, and I'm also applying the principles from my book, Skip the Line, which is in part about uh, adult improvement. You like how do you get good at something when you're in your thirties, forties, fifties? You know, because people change interests, they change the things they love doing. So so for the past six years, for instance. I started from scratch in like 2015 doing stand-up comedy and I had to, you know, and of course I was horrible at first, but then using these techniques for adult improvement, I, I quickly got better to the point where I was touring and, and performing all around and all over the world. And, and then during the lockdown, I couldn't do that. So I started getting into chess and I said, said to myself pro to really just to rationalize why I was playing, <laughs> spending so much time playing chess. I figured, okay, I'm going to use the techniques from my book 
to get better to get better than I used to be at at chess. So so first thing I did was I have a chapter called plus minus equal. Find a plus, find your equals, and find a minus, and I'll explain what that means. So find a plus means you have to take lessons from somebody. So uh, because they could help you take a look at your games and how to study and how to put together a training program and tell you ideas you didn't know before. It's good to have a coach. And then it's good to have equals, like people who you're going to play chess with. And not uh, not just a blitz game, but for the first time in 25 years, I played games with a classical time control and and then really studied them. And, you know, to your, your point earlier about blitz, I find that because I am playing more classical chess now and then analyzing them and annotating them afterwards, my blitz has gotten better because I'm understanding the ideas more. And, you know, when you when you understand tactics that could help in critical situations in a blitz game, but understanding ideas means you could kind of, OK, this is where I do this plan. That's a good five or six moves of, of blitz moving that I wasn't able to do before. So my blitz has improved because of my classical playing. But then you also have to find a minus. So I literally called up people I used to give lessons to back in the early 90s. Huh. And I asked them, can I start giving you lessons again? And they all said yes. And so I've been giving lessons as well, because the idea is if you can't explain something simply, then you don't truly understand it yourself. And it's, I, it's, you know, the minus part has helped me just every bit as much as the plus and equals part. And so right now, so I started off taking lessons from Eric Rosen, particularly on the opening side. And then I started taking lessons from, uh, and I'm still taking lessons from uh, Grandmaster uh, Jesse Cry who, and the lessons have been really phenomenal for me, understanding and going over games with, with a grandmaster is such a different experience than I remember doing in the nineties. Like, it's just phenomenal to me that the difference. Yeah. And, Jesse's and, and, great. And the fact that he's like, uh, you know, middle-aged dad like us and like, you know, he's kind of in the same boat as he talks about in, in chess dojo, the, the road to 2500 series. He, he wants to get to, to regain some old glory as well. So it's nice to have like a coach who relates. Yeah. And, and, and it's interesting because again, like I, uh, I think the only thing I used to focus on in my lessons before was, Oh, you play the Kings Indians. So here's some lines you should look at. And they're a little in, you know, you focus on what sidelines are good and what are the tricks in them. And uh, with, with Jesse, it's really, there is so much about the different ideas and my, understanding whether i'm good or not i don't know but my understanding of chess is at least so much different than it was in 90s just from a few months of these lessons and then just i'm studying different things than i used to study before like every day i'll go through several ulf anderson games something right. i never would have done before but he's like an incredible end game player and so i've been learning a lot about something i never would have studied before and uh i'll spend about an hour a day on tactics uh, you know, I've been using the, the, that book, the woodpecker method you had, uh, Axel Smith on. Yeah. And, uh, I think, I think that's a great book, but there's other ways to study tactics too. Not everybody likes the, the woodpecker style. So, you know, I also have, uh, an app that has tactics from like different openings. I play, I think it's, it's like a King's Indian app, but it has all the oh, wow. tactics you might see in the King's Indian. You know so what I'll go over called? that. Uh, yeah, it's on my phone. If you just right, search Kings in the app store. Yeah. And, okay. um, and, and then also like Ilyas Marin has this good book, uh, Kings Indian warfare, which has tactical puzzles. So, you know, I like those types of positions, studying the tactics specific to them. And then I've been going through, uh, Boris Gelfand's books, you know, positional decision-making in chess, technical decision-making in chess. And then there's another book that Eric Rosen recommended, which is, um, Grandmaster Structures which uh, yeah. different pawn structures that come out of different openings. What are the plans associated with them? Is that and that the Rios book, like, one, chess structures? Yeah, Mauricio something. Yeah, Flores Rios, yeah. yeah. And, he's, and He's been on the show too. He's yeah. a good, it was a good interview. Um, he, it blew my mind that, that, that book actually, because again, it was a way of studying that I had never done before. Like I'm seeing chess at least from a whole different point of view. And that's been so pleasurable to me uh it's it's been i feel like that's worth it i mean chess is just such this beautiful game of of ideas and studying it in that way i've never done before and it's it's really opened up my mind to a, a different understanding of chess awesome um, i gotta follow up on that james but first we're gonna take a break and hear from our sponsors 
Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by aimchess.com. If you haven't checked out aimchess.com by now, what are you waiting for? What Aim Chess does is it collects your games from the major chess sites and then gives you actionable advice of how to improve your game. It might be to work on a specific opening or to get better at end games or improve your time management or whatever it may be. And then it gives you related puzzles to help you improve that specific skill. They are constantly improving the site. They recently added blindfold tactics, time management training, common checkmate patterns. So there's so much to do there. If you decide to subscribe, be sure to use the promo code PERPETUAL30. Details are in the show notes for aimchess.com. So James, you mentioned uh, Axel Smith's woodpecker method. So as, a, as such a student of adult learning, and again, James writes about this on his blog. He's written about it in, across his books. Um, and as you mentioned, you even uh, had some interactions with Anders Ericsson, the uh, 10,000 hours originator, uh, not, my, not Malcolm Gladwell. Um, so where are you on space repetition for tactics? You know, I've asked uh, cognitive scientist Christopher Chabri about this. I asked, I, I asked Axel Smith himself. But I feel like that's where the science is unsettled. Obviously, space repetition is good for learning openings. But what about tactical patterns as opposed to like training calculation? Well, how do you think about repeating the tactics as opposed to trying to solve new puzzles? Uh, I think it's I think it's probably a good thing because you need you need something that when I'm when I'm playing a game, you know maybe I'll have some creative ideas and come up with something new. But it's great when you see a position where you're like, oh, I've seen something like this before and you're able to apply or at least think of the plan that you saw before. So and this could this is worthwhile in tactics. This is worthwhile in openings. This is worthwhile in end games. But I don't think there could be anything bad about, you know, that book, The Woodpecker Method, method has eleven hundred twenty eight puzzles in it. And when you when you repeat all the all the puzzles, by the way, it's not as if, oh, I remember this. And yeah, this is an easy, no, for sure. yeah. like even, even on the, you know, it's divided into easy, intermediate, advanced, even on the easy, even though I've gone through the uh, puzzles like three or four times now, uh, even in the easy section, I'll still have, sometimes have to stop and I'll even get an answer wrong. Like it's, it's not easy to remember the, that you've seen this before, but you start, I do think there is some pattern recognition and I don't think it can hurt. I think it's, I think it's probably better than, I think studying with that method is probably better than for instance, playing bullet all day. Although that's still an addiction that yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been getting better at avoiding because I feel like there's no value to that. But so I've gone from like, let's say seven days a week of playing bullet to one day a week of playing bullet. Yeah. I have to do zero tolerance on bullet because otherwise suddenly it's three in the morning. You know, and like, yeah. And you're, and you're angry. <laughs> yeah. Suddenly I'm smoking a cigarette. I don't even smoke. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The bad, the bad scene. I'm kidding. And you feel like your life though. is. You feel like your life is getting worse just because your ranking's going down on the <laughs> test. Exactly. Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> My life is getting worse in real time at two in the morning because <laughs> I'm losing losing to some seventeen hundred on bullet. I, but, I've uh, been there. Uh, you know, but but it's interesting. Like I, I another thing I, I started doing in the beginning was I said to myself, well, what are the micro skills I need to learn? Because chess, there's no one skill that says, oh, I'm good at chess. Like the, there's a, it's a chess is a basket of skills. So there's openings, there's middle games, there's uh, end games. But even there, there's uh, there's major piece end games where where you're more likely to to get into in your games than kind of these theoretical rook and pawn versus rook type end games. There's different types of tactics. You know, there's kind of like the brute force white to play and win tactic. But then there's tactics of okay, how do you um, best convert an advantage using you know, and what advantage is it that you're even converting? And so there's different types of ways to to study calculation. And then uh, uh, even in the openings, I'm studying it a lot differently, which is trying to remember, or not trying to remember, but really trying to understand the ideas behind the openings, making the assumption that my memory is no longer as good as, as it was 25 years ago, which I'm not so sure, but at least studying the ideas is giving me, I don't know, I feel like in general, it's improving my all around chess so there's all these different micro skills you have to study as well to improve if you just study openings or if you just study tactics i don't think you'll get that much better it kind of has to have you have to have a, an arsenal yeah no i mean and it's good that you you've come back to it because i mean for all that you've achieved in other fields and like obviously what you did in stand-up comedy as we talked about a bit in our first interview like it's it's super impressive but to me, in some sense, like adult improvement in chess, it's like the it's like the end boss. It's like the fu the final challenge. It's just so so hard, especially like 
I think at our age, like uh, depending on circumstances. So it's fun that, that someone like you who has like the time and the resources to devote to it. Like, I'm super excited to see to see what you can do. Well, well, you know, it's interesting because time, of course, is an issue. Like I have a family as well and I have other responsibilities. And as you get older, obviously, like like when we were all in high school, you could study all day long. Like, no, I didn't care about classes at all. I would right. just study chess literally like 20 hours a day. Uh, and I mean, I studied chess for about a one and a half year period when I was 17, and 18. And then I studied chess for about a six to eight month period in 1997. And then I haven't, that's it. That's all studying. I've, it's all the work I've put into it. And now I'm really putting more work than ever into it these past uh, seven or eight months. And I, I feel like I'm just like, as our mutual friend, Greg Shahade once told me, it's like, you don't know anything about chess, but somehow you're still <laughs> playing. And here I was rated right. 2200, but I really didn't have any positional understanding at all. Like I, people would say, oh, it's a space advantage. I didn't know what that meant even as a 2200. And now that I'm understanding more what that means, it's really blowing my mind how little I knew and even and know now about chess. And then also with on the opening side, everything, the, it's like the world changed. Like when I, when I last played, no one was playing the London system. I never even heard of the London system right, before. Yeah. And then I start playing again, everyone's playing the London system. And, uh, uh, and then I started working with, I, I like, I watched some Eric Rosen videos and I liked his openings. And so we started, I first I was learning with him and I changed from D I'd been playing D four since for 30 years. Now I'm playing E four exclusively on the white side. And it's a completely different game. I didn't realize yeah. this is like, I'm like learning the rules of chess again, switching from D four to E four. Like I'm really trying to be disciplined about playing E four, particularly on the classical games I'm playing. And it's just every step of the way, it's like I'm uncovering all this stuff I didn't know before. And you know, learning. It's just, I, I, I love all the new things I'm seeing in the game. That's awesome. And dare I ask if you've like selected a tournament yet where you'll uh, make, make your comeback official? Yeah, I think I'm going to play in the Southern Open from July 21st to 23rd. Uh, oh, wow. And we'll see. I, I'm, I might be moving that weekend. If I'm not moving, I'm going to play. But that's what I mean. Like adults just can't say, hey, I'm going to play this weekend. Like you have like tons of other things. So I try to wake up an hour early or an hour, two hours early to study a little during the day. I'll find pockets of time to study. Uh, I'll try to study instead of playing blitz, which is a new thing for me. And uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting because I'm trying to also not have to put in 10,000 hours. Like I don't really believe in the 10,000 hour rule. So I try to experiment more with what I'm doing and try to understand different ideas much more quickly. So it's just it's 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 been a it's been a challenge because also the other thing about learning as an adult, which is I think a, a nuance which you have to psychologically deal with, is let's say I do the woodpecker method today, you know, or the next few weeks. It's six months from now. I won't see my tactics get. I'll, I might see my tactics get worse in actual play. I won't. I won't really be. I notice in general whenever you learn something, it takes a good three to six months at least before what you learn today actually works in your games and, and you have to and i think repetition does help like when i'm going over these ulf anderson games or let's say boris gelfin's book i'll have to play over a game and analyze it several times over before i feel i could even refer to the one thing i might have learned from that game but then i but then a few months later i will see it like oh that's like that game boris gelfin was showing about rubenstein that now he rubenstein played this and now i'll play it yeah. So how long do you spend going over a typical game? Because um, as we were talking before we were recording, that's something I struggle with, particularly since I'm reading so many books for the podcast. Like, are you willing to spend one hour on a game or are you just kind of like five, 10 minutes a game and on to the next one? Yeah. Every, well, every morning I at least do an hour of going over a, a, a game or two. So maybe it'll be about two, two games in an hour. But I really try to figure out what's the one thing. And I even write it. I'll write it down most of the time. What's the one thing? I really learned here and I tried to, you know, remember that what situation it was, how the players played it, you know, what, what do I take out of this? And then I tr try to write down what I took out of it. And sometimes it's just basic concepts. And again, I didn't know all these things. Uh, this is, these are the pieces you try to trade when you have a space advantage. These are, you know, this is, 
here, here's a strong square. Here's how you right. can take advantage of it. And I didn't know these things. Oh, you put the knight on d5, and then that's how you use a strong square. I didn't really know any of the subtleties other than that. Yeah, Gelfand's good on the space advantage. But we should say for listeners, the Gelfand books are very advanced. Of course, James, as a USCF mon- master, most of the books we're talking about for listeners, they they might be... um. They might be dauntings before you run out and order them if you're rated, say, below like 1,700, although Chess Structures is the one exception. That book is, as Kostya Kowalski said, it's like candy. <laughs> Everyone loves it. You know, it's digestible, and I think there's something for, for people all the way down to, say, 1,500, to, to plenty of things to learn from that book. But but I never would have, I, I, again, beforehand, I never would have thought like, okay, let's just look at 20 games of the asymmetric Benoni. Here right. are all the ideas, and here's... You know, and he, it's such a great, well done book. Like, here's the time white is using this idea and doing well. Here's when white's using this idea and not doing well. Here's when black's using this idea and doing well. And so you start to catalog the, the the four or five plans per pawn structure or per opening structure. And then, you know, again, I don't remember all the games, but I try to remember the one, oh, this is when this person does F5. This is when this person does C6 and how it turns out. And, and it's really great. Like, and also, I've been picking players to follow. Again, like, Ulf Anderson or Kasparov. I'll go through Kasparov so great with a lot of the openings that I play. And it's fascinating now what I'm seeing in his games as opposed to what I, you know, used to study in his games. Yeah. And, and I want to get more to Kasparov a bit later because of course you've gotten to interview him a couple of times, but James, first we're going to take one more break and hear from our sponsors. Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable, of course, is known for its proprietary move trainer technology, which utilizes space repetition to quiz you and make sure that you remember whatever tactical patterns or opening sequences that you're working on. They have a huge catalog of great books from top flight authors, both for purchase. And if you check for their short and sweet courses, you can find tons of free content. Speaking of free content, Chessable, of course, has also recently launched an adult improvement focused chess podcast called How to Chess with yours truly hosting it. Check for it on Chessable's YouTube channel, and you can also subscribe on the podcast platforms. And we are back. So James, we've got some more chess improvement to uh, to talk about. But first, I wanted to ask you about interviewing Kaspar because I haven't managed to pull it off yet myself. Um, you know, Yasser Sarawan has talked about how when he played Kasparov over the board, it was like playing a caged lion. Like all these grandmasters talk about how you can sort of feel the energy and feel the intimidation. So when you're like interviewing him through uh, Zoom or Squadcast or whatever, was it was it an intimidating experience for you? It's a it's a hundred percent intimidating. And by the way, <laughs> I say this because since I've interviewed him on the podcast three times now, but we've become friends in the process, and our wives have become friends and. We get together occasionally, and he's he's always intimidating. Yeah, <laughs> so he's he's so smart, and and obviously he has a a, a particular way of uh, expressing his opinion, whether it's on the chessboard or in other things. But he's he's a really a, a, a great person, and a, 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 you know has become you know someone I really enjoy talking to. And uh, but we played the very first time I interviewed him, I asked if I could play him. Because I figured, what else am I going to get the chance? And I could just see he did not want to play. But we we played a game. It's on YouTube somewhere, and he just he just crushed me. But before we played, like he's you know he's centering each piece on its square, and, and, <laughs> right. and I have to say he took more time than I did. Like he really, you could see like the energy. Like he's it's like he's thinking, you know, so hard on each position, even against someone like me, and. Uh, but then now I look at the game and I'm embarrassed because again, there were like some basic positional things that I just messed up on pretty early in the game. And he was able to just use that and, and crush me. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, it's good that you had that experience and getting back to to what you were saying earlier about like learning the, the ideas of the opening. That is something I've noticed like a lot of strong players talk about and I'm trying to incorporate, like there's, there's really a fine line between just memorizing moves and then, having studied an opening enough where when your memory fails you, you, you're not just like totally lost at sea. Yeah. And like knowing, I mean, it should be, sometimes it's not so obvious. What are the important factors in an opening, particularly early on, but like really understanding those factors. And, and so then you can understand what positions 
oh, I like to play this position because it's a little bit more open or a little more attacking. Or this sort of position, if you if both sides castle on the same side, you're not really playing for a, a huge advantage at first, or you're not really playing for an attack, you, you know, depending on the opening. So just understanding basic stuff like, well, what do, what, do, what do people usually do with their bishops in this opening or this type of position? And I wonder, you know, one time when I was a long time ago, I, one of my first chess coaches when I was like 18 was Michael Wilder, who retired in the early 90s after he won the U.S. championship. And he once told me that basically anybody could get to 2400. That was his quote was that he said even a monkey could get to 2400 rating. <laughs> And I always wondered like what he was referring to. Like if you, well, do you think he meant like if you just study tactics, you could get to 2,400 because I mean, that would explain the 11 year olds out there who are 2,400 rated, uh, but you know, cause they might have some, you know, calculation talent. Uh, but I, I don't know. I think for me, I would have to really deeply understand the positional ideas to get to 2,400. Yeah, I think that the grand grandmasters are not the best people to to make that judgment. <laughs> there's there's a lot of people who worked pretty hard, who you know didn't didn't end up anywhere near twenty four hundred. So I mean, and the 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 discussion as I talked about uh, with adult improver Vishnu Srikumar, like if you start to debate like what people's natural ceiling is, the the problem is like you it quickly becomes so hypothetical that it's almost pointless to debate. You know, because very I, quick. Go ahead. Yeah, I think I think that is pointless because I don't think anybody here's what's probably true is that the the organic ceiling for any player probably is above 2400 and really the factor is is how much work you put into it like uh and 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 the quality of the work because if you just like play or even if you just like study casually and don't really you know it's one thing studying Kasparov's games oh that was a neat attack but it's another thing understanding like how was he able to get this attack against another top 10 level player, uh, you know, on the planet? It's not so easy to do. Yeah. So what was he doing to get, to be able to get this attack? Like how, you know, I can't imagine playing someone who's 2750 and getting a position so good that I could then mate them. Yeah. And that's really the, the skill that Kasparov's got. Uh, I mean, among every other skill he's got in chess, but uh, understanding the why uh, a lot more than the what has been really important for me. Yeah, and then when you get to like Alpha Zero and Leela Zero and even Stockfish, like that takes it to a whole nother level. Like, have you read uh, Game Changer by uh, Matthew Sadler and Natasha Regan, James? Yeah, uh, and by the way, here's a just a story. Uh, I read I read the book and I loved it, and it was. Uh, and then so I, next time I saw uh, Gary, I said, "Hey, have you read?" Uh, you know, alpha changer or whatever you call it, you know, by, by Matthew Sadler. And, and, and he said, read it. I wrote the forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Be careful. And so Be careful. <laughs> I was embarrassed a little bit, but uh, yeah, no, that's interesting too, to understand like, okay, here's what alpha zero is doing. It's fixing the center. And once he's, once alpha zero is satisfied with that, pushes the H pawn all the way down to H six <laughs> and then checkmates the guy. So, yeah. but then you have to wonder like, well, is it, you know, as we all wonder so, so often when our pawn is on H5 and ready to go to H6, what if they just do G6 and I can't open up any lines? Well, Alpha Matthew gets into that and Alpha Zero, uh, you know, carves out squares around the king is what he calls it. And understanding what that means and, and how 50 moves later Alpha Zero wins because of that is interesting, which I didn't even think about before. Yeah, and I can only imagine, like, with the top guys, I mean, to the extent, obviously, they're doing a lot of calculation training and tons of opening work and, and assistant with the engine. But I wonder, like, to what extent someone like, I mean, obviously, he incorporated some ideas and you see sort of the, the H-pawn play, like, an increased role in, in top-level chess. But I wonder how much of, like, actual just study comes from from those games because it is, it's mind-blowing stuff. Like, beating a top-10 player in the world and, like, someone like you or me trying to figure out like where the losing player went wrong, like that, that's hard enough. But then figuring out where Stockfish went wrong to be like beaten like a child is like, that's like a whole nother level. But Matthew Sadler does a good job, thank, thankfully, yeah. and Natasha Regan in explaining it. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. That's a, that's a really valuable book because you understand a couple of things from that book uh, in, with, with really studying the games is that the, your, your king is almost constantly in danger throughout the whole game. Yeah. And if you don't realize that, you're going to get checkmated, particularly against a computer or against like Alpha, Alpha Zero or Stockfish. And so it's interesting to see how you could almost 
you could be like totally winning like uh, in, in a game, but if the other guy does focus on your king and things are relatively stable and you don't pay attention, you're going to get checkmated pretty quickly. Like, I think that's the innovation of Alpha Zero is that your king's never really safe. The other thing is, is that every pawn is passed until you prove it otherwise. <laughs> right. And so if I just ignore any passed pawn, even if it's like on the, the, the second rank, I'm going to, that pawn's going to queen if I ignore it. And like, yeah. and, and I think that's, you realize that's a weakness, like, that's a weakness of mine is that when someone starts pushing pawns, I've got to respond much more quickly than I'm, than I'm used to doing. And then you also see any move, any weakening move in front of the king, you're going to get checkmated. Right. So if you do, oh, I'm going to just do pawn to rook three, you know, or h3 chasing out the, the bishop that's uh, pinning my knight. No, you're going to lose now. <laughs> that h3 just destroyed your king side. Uh, unless you're careful, unless you know what you're doing. Like, that's what I've been realizing that. Uh, and then now when I look at games too, somebody makes, oh, I'm going to break with the f pawn. Well, you just opened up your king. So let's see how. The other, the other grandmaster on the other side exploits that. And I never used to look for those things before. I will yeah. say that now that I've been doing this seven or eight months, at first it was so frustrating. Like I, I was on Lee Chess, I kept floating around the 2000s at Blitz. Blitz was what I was playing mostly. But now, and, and I, like I would do, I, I don't understand this. I've been studying tactics like an hour a day for two months. Why, are, why am I blundering? And now it, I feel like it's kicked in a little more. Like now I've gone from the 2000s to over 2300 in the past few months on Lee Chess. Like I feel, again, that's why I feel it takes three to six months for something you learn today to kind of settle in into your, your intuition later. So I feel confidently in the 2300s now, whereas I wasn't even confident in the 2000s, you know, six months ago. That that's reassuring. That's good to hear. Um, for me, and I'm sure for a lot of a lot of listeners, my Lee Chess Blitz rating is usually in the 2200s and hasn't been moving much. Although I haven't been doing four hours a day. Now, let me ask you, James. Like you mentioned, micro skills frequently in your books, and of course in um in our interviews. Um, what are the micro skills of speed chess? Like how much of it is just that your knowledge is increasing versus like now that you're like you in our first interview described being on the phone while you played, like I'm, I'm guessing you're not doing that as much anymore. Like how much of it no. is like game management? No, now I'm serious. Now I seriously care about my lead chess rating um, or chess.com. But I do more on lead chess. Uh, I care about it because it's, it's a metric for how I'm improving. So I don't want to waste that time. I, I don't want to waste rating. And, and and by the way, it's not like you can't have a fixed mindset, which basically says, uh, "Oh, I'm either twenty two hundred or I suck, or you know, I, I'm not learning anything." If I, you know, sometimes you're experimenting with things or learning new ideas, so your rating's going to naturally go down as you learn these things, particularly in blitz chess. But I do think what's helped me the most with blitz is playing classical and then really going over in depth classical games, or really going over in depth with someone like. Jesse, a, a grandmaster, really going over in depth a good strategic positional game or teaching chess reminds me again of all the basic ideas and fundamentals. And that helps me enormously now in blitz. And of course, calculation, I still can't figure out if I'm worse or better than I used to be. Maybe I've caught up to be the same. I don't know. But I think calculation in general is harder for me now than it was in 30 years ago or 25 years ago. Yeah. And so that ideas are, are have to be much more important. You know what's really interesting with tactics? So like in, if you use something like the woodpecker method, there's like white to move and win positions where it's like nine moves later is the, the critical move. And, you know, it's but I, but I realize in most games, even grandmaster games, it's two move tactics that win yeah. or lose most of the games. Like you play these ideas and it's kind of rare that, oh, my gosh, it's white to mate and 10 in this odd way. Uh, it's more like some positional idea works because of a one or two move tactic. And, and you have, and that's at the 2700 level. You see this play out over and over again, is that it's just these two or three move tactics that the kind of stuff you see in puzzle storm or puzzle rush that, that, you know, kind of, you need that, but the, but they're the kind of troops behind that reinforce the positional ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, so much of it is about the consistency of spotting them too. It's not just like, cause uh, most people can spot two move tactics, but it's, so it's not a matter of like ability. It's a matter of like, do, do you miss your shots, you know, or do you give your opponent the shots, you know? Well, and, and I think actually those are two radically different things in most cases. So like, yeah. uh, you know, I think blundering is actually a different part of the brain than tactics. 
because most of the time when we blunder, if you were to say black to move and lose, let's say you're playing black. If you were to look at it as a problem, black to move and lose right now, right. you'll, you'll, you'll solve it instantly. Oh, black's hanging his queen. But yeah, you see, even at like the, at, you know, Magnus Carlson, you see him on now because all these, you know, super GMs are sharing their videos on their games on YouTube. You see him miss constantly one or two move tactics, but just miss them far fewer than the twenty set the the twenty nine hundred player. Right, you know, he's like a thirty one hundred player on Lee Chess. So uh, it's you know again, I think uh, you know like if I'm playing classical chess, I could do I, I could do Puzzle Storm all day long, studying those you know playing those two move checkmates and and you you solve them like a second at a time. But in a real classical game. It actually takes you a while to even see the two or three move tactics. Like, oh, I have this two move tactic I didn't notice before. So it helps more to know what you're even looking for in a different type of in different types of positions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so much, so much to learn. It's a it's a challenge, constant challenge for sure. I mean, I mean, you've interviewed like a lot of people who have been. Uh, first off, adult improvement has become people have become obsessed with it lately because of the Queen's Gambit. Like all all the people like you and me who played. Maybe as a teenager, we had a start or, or even younger, but I haven't played in 25 years seriously. And, you know, you get inspired to be there again. And so it's become a real hot topic, right? You've interviewed yeah. so many more adult improvers than you used to. Like, what have you, what have you, what do you think of the takeaways from interviewing all these great players who have written about adult improvement? Yeah. I mean, what's interesting to me, and I mentioned this um, on Twitter or somewhere, like, for example, the most recent adult improver interview I did was with uh, Braden Lachlan who's a bit younger than most of the adult improvers I've interviewed because he was 17 when he got into chess and now he's 22, but he's already like 2,200 blitz on Lee chess, which like, you know, that I really, I really hear the footsteps of like everyone under 25 trying to get better at chess. But like his approach was so much different than everyone else I've, I've interviewed. I mean, he was, he just watches chess videos, but um, he had some health issues where he was basically um, just, like sitting around all day. So he, he went for volume, you know, he would watch videos like 16 hours a day, basically. And he's like, okay, if I zone out for half of it, that's still eight hours a day. Whereas like to, to all the dads I've interviewed, that's like unimaginable. You know, it's like, we feel like we can't waste a moment, you know, even though we still might waste a moment. Um, that, that's, so why, that's why you have to wake up like earlier because that's the only time I can watch, you know, 30 to 60 minutes of YouTube videos. So I, I think, watching the right youtube videos is is great and and by the right youtube videos some chess videos are really great for entertainment if you appreciate chess like it's great to see different you know players play and they're funny while they're playing and they get upset when they blunder and so on but there are some players that whose youtube videos are insanely valuable to to watch like i enjoy watching daniel naraditsky i had a feeling you were going to go there yeah he's amazing go on yeah he he like for instance I've watched this one in a video he describes where Fabiana Caruana is playing um, black in a King's Indian. And the way Daniel analyzes this game is is really great. And um, so he's good when he's like really picking apart games. I also like uh, Sam Shanklin's uh, banter blitz videos. He He's really good at feeling like, at saying things like, oh, in this type of position, you do this. And this type of yeah. position, you do this. And then someone will make a move and it's like, okay, He's obviously trying to checkmate me with that piece. That piece doesn't look like it's going to checkmate me. And then <laughs> you think about it and you're right. Like, oh, how could that piece checkmate the king? So then you start to see how he reacts based on these opinions that he forms. And so you build an intuition of how Sam Shanklin thinks. And then, uh, by the way, after I watch one of these videos by Daniel or Sam or, or Jesse Cry, for instance, I'll play and my blitz will be like artificially like 30 huh. or 50 points better. Just for like an hour, and then That's it goes great. back down. <laughs> yeah, and when you do your lessons with Jesse, like how many are you do, like are you how many are you doing uh, per week or per month, and uh, and what sort of stuff do you guys cover? Uh, we're doing three a week, an hour each time, and uh, we we cover basically we analyze games. So if I have a, a long classical game that I've played, we'll analyze that and really dive deep into it. Like maybe we'll get 15 moves in. We won't, we usually don't get to the whole game and, uh, or we'll, we'll pick a game, let's say an Ulf Anderson game or a Karbov game or a Kasparov game. And we'll really go in depth in that game or during the candidates tournament, we would just go over 
actually whatever position was live that looked interesting and during the candidates tournament. And it was a great for me to analyze side by side with a grandmaster to see what he was looking at, to see what I seem to be good at and what I seem not to be good at. Like, you know, what's also was interesting was, you know, there would be a game where I thought I played really good and he'll ask me, well, why didn't you do this, 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 some, you know, he, he'll look for much more aggressive options than I looked at for. And so it was interesting to see how often he's, he's looking for the aggressive mood, whereas I would have just played the weak defensive move instead. And so it's for, interesting for me to see the differences in our, in our skill, which are of course are many. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's got a great natural understanding. Um, any other favorite? Wait, go ahead. Oh, oh, I just want to say the, what, one of the reasons that I started working with Jesse is I saw that he was on Twitch and I, in tw in, in like 1988, we were both playing in the U S junior open. And he, of course he was much lower rated then. And I beat him in a game. And, but so we played some uh, games. I, I hadn't seen or heard of him and since then. And so we played some games on, you know, on chess.com while, and he was streaming it on Twitch and I was just crushed every single time. <laughs> right. So I figured, okay, I got to take lessons from this guy and see what, why I'm just getting crushed instantly in every single game. That that's funny. Um, so working three hours a week, you outlined your study regimen. We, we know three you're three hours a day. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> what am I saying? Um, and you've got your first tournament tentatively targeted. Dare I ask James, do you have a rating goal or are you going to manage to be like process oriented? Well, I think it's great when people say, Oh, it's the, it's the process, not, not the goal. And, uh, and I think that is really true, but I do have a rating goal, which is I want to, I, I actually have a rating and ranking goal is I want to be 2,400 and, you know, move up the ladder in, in terms of ranks. And then at 2,400, I'm probably going to want to be 2,500 if I'm still nice. interested at that level. Right. Which is always the issue. And I feel like, uh, no offense, but I mean, you've accomplished so much in your life that it's like, it's not hard for me to imagine you, you moving on at some point. Well, it's, it's interesting. I still, but I still have, I mean, my passion for it has become, I get obsessed with things. And so again, to the detriment of other things, I, I become obsessed with chess. I will say what's really interesting is understanding, you know, when, like when we were all kids, we would memorize openings. We would have an opening repertoire. And so, you know, what you would play against every opening is white. You know, what you play against every variation is black. But now what's really interesting to me is developing a middle game, middle game repertoire. So understanding, you know, space advantage or isolated pawn or hanging pawns or, uh, uh, you know, when to push the H pawn or when to do a kind of Grand Prix attack type of attack and having a repertoire of all the middle game skills has, has been really a focus of, of my learning Good and, and also being more comfortable with the end game. Yeah. Yeah. At the end game, like I mentioned that I'm weak at, uh, tactics for my reading, which I believe is true, but end games are <laughs> are also uh, an issue. Although I think if I focus on like end game studies, like composed positions that are tactical, my hope is I'll get better at both. Uh, well, you know, have you seen uh, Van Perlo's book? Uh, I think it's called End Game Tactics. Yeah, everyone it, raves about that book. I haven't been able to get into it. I mean, I picked it up a couple times because it kind of, a lot of uh, grandmaster guests have recommended it, and it just doesn't grab me. I'll, I'll do probably about an hour a week with that book at different times. Like I'll pick it up like 10 minutes here, 15 minutes there. And uh, it's really interesting because people don't realize the end game is like probably more tactical than most middle game positions because the board's wide open in the end game. Yeah. Yeah. And, and especially like as the number of pieces lessen, it can become more, more concrete um, in some situations. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then also what's been really interesting to me is understanding what a tempo means. Like everyone's like, oh, you just moved a piece twice. You just gave black a tempo. Well, I didn't really know what that meant before other than me saying it. <laughs> but now like understanding the importance of tempo, A, you really get a feel for it when studying end games, but B, it's so incredibly important in the opening, much more important than I would have realized. But the other thing is, when you use the chess engine, you realize that almost every set of opening moves are fine for either side. Yeah, <laughs> like especially as, at as our long level. as there's not a blunder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe at the GM level, we can really get punished again. Talking about what you mentioned about space, the openings where you give up space, it doesn't seem like a good idea to give up space against the twenty seven hundred. But at our level, that's not going to decide the game for the most part. If you play the modern yeah. or whatever, you know. Yeah, no, but but like for instance, I would play the modern, and particularly in the past like 10, 15 years there's various refutations to how I used to play it. So I had to really like deeply dive in 
So I got I got uh, Tiger Halal Person's book, The Modern Tiger, and I had to really dive in. Like these moves that I've been playing for thirty years, what am I doing wrong now? What are what's the deeper meanings behind them? And that's that's really important. But you know, to your point about the high the super GMs. I've actually made a point of studying Magnus Carlsen's weirdest openings. So for instance, he's played a four as his first move and then rook a three. And I, I, I thought this game was just like a joke when I first saw it, but then you realize every move he has a reason. He actually has a reason for a five for a four as the first move, a reason for rook a three. And you see how his opponent who's in the 2700s doesn't quite get all the reasons. I mean, this is in retrospect, you could say this, and but you see how he's so consistent, even this game where he starts off a four and rook a three or another game, he starts off knight h three and then f three. And you realize, oh, he has a plan from the beginning and he follows through on that plan. Yeah. And he's good in banter blitzes, too. I mean, obviously, of course, he's freaking amazing at chess. So no surprise there. But he's surprisingly good at explaining ideas. And and again, like like what you said about Sam Shanklin, like just in these positions, you do this sort of thing. Well, also, what's really great about now, you could, we could hear these super GMs talking. They, they they have a certain confidence. Like, they'll say, okay, after this, 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 Black's not going to lose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, for, for us, it'd be like, okay, after this, 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 it feels like I'm a little better, I hope, and I hope I don't blunder <laughs> after right. this because I'm, because I'm probably better. They know they're going to win if they get into a certain type of position. And seeing that process where they go from, like, strategic to strategic play to converting that strategy to uh, you know a position where they're clearly better uh, it's just really fascinating and again i i write i keep lists of like they might say one thing and i'll write that down i try to learn one thing from each game as opposed to like memorizing a game and it's the same thing with openings like i can't possibly remember openings but i try to learn the ideas because then if things go awry on the, the opening moves as long as you don't fall into a trap you could still kind of fix fix your position yeah, that that's good advice. And as someone who's again studied the field of learning generally, um, I like the idea of trying to get one idea from everything. Do you have any other sort of like study hacks or shortcuts that you've developed that you think might be beneficial for other improvers listening? Well, I do think, and this is related to the other idea, which is just that that book, Grandmaster Structures. Everybody, it, it's not necessarily an advanced book. I do think everyone should know a little bit what to do in all of those different pawn structures he talks about. Like, oh, here's the Maroxy bind. Here's a King's Indian structure. Here's a Benoni structure. Because we get into those positions all the time. You might as well know what your repertoire of plans are for those positions. But I do think uh, the the idea of getting one salient point out of each game you look at, that's almost like the Woodpecker method where oh, this is what Kasparov did against Kamsky, and that Samish is he opened up the C-file and he attacked on the king's side, and he'd go back and forth until he broke Kamsky down. So understanding, like, in a single sentence what was great about different games. So I don't remember Magnus Carlsen playing that A4 game, but now, but I do remember thinking while going over that game over and over again, he had a plan every step of the way, even though it seems like a silly opening. And huh. uh, uh, so, so, again... And then understand, I do think watching the videos is great, but make sure you know who you're watching and what what you're learning from that person. Again, try to get one thing out of even their bullet games. Try to get at least one thing that you've learned out of each game. I do think avoiding blunders is incredibly important for us older people. And again, it, studying tactics won't really help you avoid blunders that much. I think you really have to be disciplined about having a, a basic checklist with each move. Like, am I hanging anything? Am, or am I, can he check in the middle of all of this? Like, right. you know, and, and the other thing is, and this is what I learned having students now is if you're calculating more than three or four moves, particularly if you're like, you know, under 1500 or under 1700, you're probably doing something wrong. Right. <laughs> like you shouldn't calculate that. You, you're a, if you have to calculate that many moves, some, you're you're going to blunder along the way because that's just even grandmasters if they have to calculate complicated complicate you know your combinations they're going to blunder they miss something an intermediate move along the way so you're always going to miss something if you're under 1700 or even under 2200 if you're the, the longer your combination is the more likely you are you're going to lose the game and very quickly and so uh, again like avoiding blunders and focusing on what the opponent is thinking is is much more important than trying to be great at tactics, I think. Okay. 
Great advice. James, and, I got and it. Take lessons is, is also important, I think. What was that? T taking lessons yeah, is important. Yeah, and again, um, for as I've mentioned many times, these days you can find, you know, Fide Masters and IMs for 25 bucks an hour. So I know I know it can be expensive um, to get lessons, but it's, you know, it's good ROI to, to just have them dump their brains on you. Um, oh, oh uh, and the final thing is, I was like, you got to play classical games, like 45 minutes on each side or more. Because it's only when you're really thinking hard and studying deep into a game and then analyzing it afterwards that you're really going to understand at a deep level all of the ideas in a, or more ideas in a position than you'll get from Blitz. And by the way, analyzing your Blitz games, that's also important. Yeah. So every Blitz game, I, I analyze and try to annotate. Yeah, I mean, it's easier than ever with the, um, you know, with the algorithms that tell you the key moments. So, yeah, it's super important. All right, James, I got to ask you about podcasting before I let you out of here. I can't resist the opportunity, but anything sure. anything else on chess before we uh, move on? Well, let me ask you, like, have you seen a, a rise in traffic, uh, A, since the Queen's Gambit, and B, since you've started focusing on uh, adult adult improvement? Um, so definitely in the Queen's Gambit, the perpetual chess listenership was up probably like uh, 40 percent, something like that, 40 to 50 percent last year, which obviously is huge. Although when you hear about like chess.com and lead chess traffic like doubling, I still feel like I got to flag some more people down. But but uh, no complaints on that front. The adult improver interviews, um, they're definitely amongst the most popular, but I didn't see like a separate jump in them and but i mean i know that some people are more interested in that than like chess broader as a broader topic so that was part of the impetus for launching how to chess which i will give a gratuitous shout out now to um so yeah that's sort of what's been been going on but certainly uh saw saw great growth in the past uh year to year and a half but it's actually yeah, it, one other thing it's come down a little bit we've lost we've lost maybe 15 percent of uh the listeners so some people didn't stick around i mean you have some great interviews like uh, like uh, your episode from June first, Dvorin uh, Kulyasevich. Yeah. I don't know how to say his name. Uh, his book on how, called "How to Study Chess on Your Own." That's a great book. Uh, like again, and and a lot of these adult improvement books do, I think, focus on middle game repertoire uh, even more than opening repertoire. And uh, what did you learn from from him? Do you think? I mean, he's an impressive guy. I mean, he was a his book, it was just like, holy crap, did he work hard? So yeah. that was like my number one takeaway was because some grandmasters, to be honest, like you can't tell how coy they're being. And I had this experience not becoming a grandmaster, but I just played and went over games with coaches and just sort of got better uh, until it stopped, you know, and I never worked that hard on chess afterwards. Now I was nowhere near a grandmaster, but some grandmasters, whether they admit it or not, that was their experience. But I think since Koyasevich, you know, he grinded. He was like his natural level. It seems like he kind of paused at 20, you know, 23, 2400. And actually Axel Smith is in the whole, the same category. And then they had to really earn those last 200 points. And actually Jesse Cry, the first time I interviewed, talked about his journey to GM. So I think that just appreciating just how much work it takes once you do hit that plateau is something that was really driven home in his book, this sort of like holistic, deep look at like every aspect of chess improvement. I mean, it was daunting also, which like when in our conversation, he tried to um, sort of reassure me like that an hour a day isn't like a total waste of time because it felt like it's just not enough. What am I even doing? You know, no, I, th I think you're right. I think he's right, though. Like an hour a day, just as long as you come out with like one thing you feel is repeatable, one thing you learn that you feel is repeatable or at least cements some knowledge that you had. It's that means after 365 days, you're going to have, you know, hundreds of those ideas. And then after a couple of years, you're going to have thousands of, of those ideas. And that's really what that's why it takes a, uh, a lot of time for these GMs. They have to learn like thousands of types of ideas and then be able to apply them. And that's what you're doing. Even on our day, if you just learn one or two things that you'll remember, uh, I think it's incredibly valuable. It's like one. It's like if you compound something at one percent a day within a year, it goes up. 38x it doesn't just go up 3x it goes up 38x because of compounding just one okay. percent a day so how do you like what's the one thing today for instance you could learn that's a one percent improvement oh maybe i'll learn the bishop c law c4 line in the modern or maybe i'll learn the ideas of the hippopotamus which sometimes i end up in or you know maybe i'll learn another thing to do in the end game or whatever another end game tactic 
Yeah, yeah, that's good advice. Unfortunately, you don't tend to 36x or 38x your rating, but you you do you do uh, slowly. But, but learn it could things. be, but it could be the difference between a 2500 and a 2400 is in some weird way 38 times better. Yeah, no, I mean definitely that's what the that's what the air quotes rank and file grandmasters say about the super GMs is like like Ben Feingold in one of his videos was saying like like only I understand how good Magnus Carlsen and is like. Or like only GMs understand how good he is because um, like to to the the lower ranked player, they just don't fathom the degree of like uh, superiority across the board. Right. And this was my this was my theory the last time we spoke, which is that uh, uh, nobody could tell the difference. If you're just if you're watching two masters play and or if you're watching two grandmasters play, if you're much lower rated, you can't tell which table is the grandmasters and which table is the masters uh, because there's a lot of nuances in the difference between you know the way let's say you and i play ben and the way two grandmasters play but the 1400 or, or 1000 rated player is not going to be able to see those nuances so i felt that's why i felt like oh i don't need to improve to have the benefits of being a, a master necessarily but now you want i want to improve because it's just so i'm seeing just so much more beauty in the game and i just i i again i'm, I'm looking at it and, and studying it in a hundred percent different way it's like a completely different game for me now that's awesome, man. I can't wait to see what you accomplish uh, because, again, I, if you do stick with it, I mean, we talked in the first interview, I feel like maybe you have some untapped talent because you ascended so quickly compared to most people. And plus, again, you're putting in the hours. So uh, definitely I want to get another report in a, in a year or two, James. Yeah. And, and you know, I, do you ever regret not start, starting earlier or studying more when you're oh, younger? Sure. Like, I, and and like then you know like uh, you have a lot of these, these people who are just naturally IMs because they started at six and were obsessed with it from six to eighteen. I mean, I started playing in tournaments when I was seventeen, and so you know then you go to college and it's, uh, where you have to work and it's it, 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 you can't it's harder to study. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I started when I was twelve, and even when I was like by the time I was fifteen, I was wishing I started earlier. Um, and you you uh, grew up with uh, Greg Shahade. Yep. Yeah, we started about the same time, and he was a year and, younger and than me. What do you think separated him from you as you were improving? Yeah, I mean, so I've talked about this. Um, he like his processor works faster than mine for sure. Full stop. No doubt about it. Um, so that's why I always like when we get into these discussions about talent, I can't just like dismiss it. It's it's not an excuse, you know. It's like it's just real life. We every time we looked at a position, uh, you know, after sort of our beginning first year or two or whatever, he would just see something faster. He also has um a, a better memory than me. Um, but of course, he also had like obviously a deep chess culture. Shout out to Mike Shahadi being a senior master. So and like chess books just all over the house. Like, I think all that that little stuff, his mom, of course, shout out to Sally, was like a great bridge player, um, like uh, in addition to being a chemistry professor. So they were kind of like the Shahadis are kind of like built in a lab to be great games players. Well, and I'm not sure then it's related to I'm, I'm always questioning, like, how much is related to the talent? I really think with, without any talent at all, one could keep improving at the same Level because again you mentioned you know his dad was a fide master is a fide master and uh, it, just a few comments showing a game to your dad every day who happens to be a fide master like good enough to train professionals you're gonna get a lot of insight and intuition really quickly that probably you weren't able to get as a kid unless yeah. you're hearing it from Greg yeah well I got to give Mike credit he gave me free lessons so I don't I don't want to oh, um, I don't want to um dismiss uh what he what he did but obviously that they're they're just living chess all the time and that was like when i was at their house or something you know so it, it, it's still different but the other thing that i mean i don't want to go on too long about about this but mike interestingly enough was like super solid player like he had this running joke about how he won games he would always just say i just take their men off you know <laughs> like you just play super solid and gradually like he played the english and he would just like uh bore people to death basically and Greg, as a Greg from the beginning, and Janet too, actually were like super duper tactical, and it was just like in their blood. They just spotted tactics instantly. Yeah, and, and I think that's the benefit of the woodpecker method is that it can't be wrong to put an hour a day into studying tactics and calculation. But I'm just aware now that it doesn't seem to come up like really hard tactics don't seem to come up as much as I would think in order to win a game in in real life, <laughs> like. 
you know, knowing knowing how to really spot even the two move tactics is incredibly useful um, for most games. Although, again, if you analyze the computer games, they're they're spotting the fifteen move tactics in a microsecond, and and of course they win every game. Yeah, it, it's crazy to say. Um, but 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 I do think that talent is is overrated, uh, so to speak. Good. I mean, I I hope you're right. I don't think like the you know. I feel like the research of this is probably still in early stages, especially when it comes to chess. And I know we've got a lot of interested listeners, hopefully, excuse me, taking up studies of their own about like what's possible at different ages. Yeah. And also like, you know, let's say you don't have a good memory. Okay. Then studying openings with a lot of traps might not be for you, but studying, let's say the English opening and what to do when you exchange Queens really early in the English opening that probably gives you an extra 200 rating points over someone at your level who hasn't really put in a lot of time on end games. Yeah. You know, your, 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 your rating changes for each micro scale. That's a good point. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, like Greg, if, if, if you're really good at tactics, like you get into, you know, you do E4 and, and play super tactical trappy stuff, play the Stafford gamut, all those. And, or if you're good at end games, play the English. If you're under good at space advantages or really under studied those a lot, get into openings where you have a space advantage. Yeah. Although there's always, yeah, I'm trying to sharpen up my old man chess game, <laughs> but, but tactics, like if you're really bad at tactics, it's going to rear its head, uh, you know, sooner or yeah. later. You still have to study tactics. I'm not yeah. saying don't study tactics. You still have to study calculation and tactics um, as well. But that, but I would remember that blunders are not, are not tactics. I really do think, it's a different part of the of the brain, and sometimes actually studying tactics and calculation can make you blunder more because you're looking for that big, particularly in the beginning of studying it, you're looking for that big tactical combination, but you might miss the 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 blunder. Yeah, because uh, you're not looking, you're spending more time, so you get into the time trouble. You're spending more time on calculation, and so you 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 you're not able to do the checklist as easily. Uh, oh, is he attacking anything? Am I blundering something? Yeah. Yeah. Well, good stuff, James. Last question I got to ask you before we go, just because um, I asked you in 2017 what inning you thought podcasts were in and sort of their uh, their their development. Um, the, and uh, you said it was in the second inning. So here we are al- almost four years later. Where do you think podcasts are like uh, relative to their peak? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I haven't thought about it like that since probably I spoke to you, but I would say inning five or six because it's it, a lot of people say, Oh, I'm going to start a podcast about entrepreneurship. Or I'm going to start a podcast about motherhood or parenting. And you can't, and, and I'm going to interview all the experts who've written books. You can't really do that anymore. Particularly the more general your podcast is, the more people would rather watch Joe Rogan yeah. than you as an example. Um, uh, uh, good advice is to what's your niche what's a niche of that yeah and what's a niche of that yeah exactly. and then and then you have a very like you ben you have an incredibly loyal audience because you not only did you focus on chess but now you're focusing on uh, adult improvement in chess which you know the fact that chess.com has doubled from let's say 30 million users to 65 million users there's that's a 35 million good chunk of them adults millions of adults now who would be interested in a lot of the episodes you're doing so but I think we're we're at that point where don't start a podcast unless you niche down twice at least and and do experiments like uh, I don't know what experiments you could do but like for instance an experiment I could do is I can say I can post a Zoom link on Twitter and uh, uh, make the theory that everyone's got a story challenge people to call call me up and uh, I'm going to interview everybody. To, to get their incredibly fascinating story. And that's an experiment I, I could do. I have not done yet, but that would be an interesting podcast. You have to, uh, I think I encourage people to experiment a lot more now because you really need to be unique. It's better to be the only than to be better. Yeah. No one could tell if you're a better interviewer than someone else who's 20% better or 20% worse, but people can tell if you're the only person doing something. Yeah, great advice. That and you touch on this, of course, and skip the line, which we should give a plug to. Was that a Kevin Kelly quote? The better to be the only. Um, I'm trying to. Uh, remember. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I notoriously steal Kevin Kelly quotes, so I have to remember <laughs> if this was one of them. I think it is actually. Yeah. Like he, by the way, he's got like one through two hundred of like life advice, and they're all incredibly good. And I think that was one of them. Yeah. So yes, yeah. better, better. Yeah. Yeah, and he, of course, the uh, originator of the one thousand true fans theory, which people can also look up. 
But anyway, so yeah, skip the line, lots of insights like this and, and some chess anecdotes sprinkled in for you, for you chess fans. But if you're like, especially if you're like uh, self-employed and, um, you know, trying to grow a business, stuff like that, James's writing is always great. And James, it's great to, great to have you back, uh, you know, knee deep in the chess world. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, and I'm taking you up on your challenge. We got to play a, a a classical training game together. Yeah, I'm trying to do. I might <laughs> again. It always feels like not enough, but I'm trying to do one rapid game per week and been rounding up some friends. So we'll we'll do a we'll do a home and home, one white, one black each week, and uh, it should be fun. Yeah, that'd be great, and it's fun too because now um, it's like. I could prepare for you. It's like we're grandmasters all of a sudden. Yeah, they they were amazing, James. And we seem to have lost a few minutes on the recording, so uh, we'll we'll have to revisit it. But uh, but again, can't wait to see what uh, what you accomplish um, in your uh, chess um, uh, reinvention and skipping the line. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Fed. I'm super excited about this, and thanks again for for having me back on the podcast. Uh, always one of my favorite podcasts to listen to. Awesome. Thanks so much, James. Thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy. Thanks to you all for listening. And thanks to those of you who help spread the word, whether it be positive reviews on podcast platforms, telling friends, social media, all that stuff helps get the word out and it is much appreciated. By the way, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at BennyFischel1. You can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group to continue the conversation, sometimes even with that week's guests. The Perpetual Chess Instagram page is back in action as well at Perpetual Chess. And you can also find all these links on the Perpetual Chess webpage, perpetualchesspod.com. But Of course, the main purpose of these closing credits is to thank everyone who supports Perpetual Chess financially. Without you all, we would not be able to put out such a consistent and hopefully quality product. So thanks so much. It really means the world to me. And in particular, I would like to give thanks to the following people and entities, starting off with my friends at chessable.com. Aside from that, I would like to thank David Lazarus of LazmanChess.com. He is the coach of Dave's Young Tigers on Lee Chess, our friends at Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Abysmal Depths of Chess blog, Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, the Apprend Chess Twitch channel, A Needy Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, the Charlotte Chess Center, the Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Eric Tam, Ewan Richardson, Farhan Thawar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, Greg Shahadi, Gregory Gullick, Guvin Manet, James Holyhead, James Kennedy, Jeff Martinson, Jens Green, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Mac- MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Selt, the King's Crusher YouTube channel, one of the original chess YouTube channels, Lucio Casada Silva, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Mr. Mike Shahadi, the legendary Mr. Dodgy, the Nerd Nays Twitch channel, GM Peter Prohaska, Peter Sodhi, the Play More Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Reuven Fisher, Reverend Roy Fry, the Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stefan Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Sven Gearson, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of Strong Chess, Todd Kennedy, the Vintage Patsers, which is a chess.com improver group. You can look them up. Wayne Beam, William Hogarth, and I also would like to thank Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Al Hastings, Alan and Maggie Sue, Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovics, Antonio Cancino, FM Andre Tarakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Bill Trammell, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Chase, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Cameron Davis, Chad Hilton, Chess Potzer Spain, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, also known as Chess Explained, Coach J's Chess Academy, 
Corey Butson, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Bleskacek, David Brown, David Hamblin, David Cramley, Dalen Shelton, Dennis Parrish, Dirk Decker, FM Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Emmanuel Langual, Robitai, Ethan Smith, Hallelujah Cat, Ian Mason, Fide Arbiter, Arbiter, Arbiter excuse me, Felipe Melo Perdera, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letart Lavoie, Frank Tor- Dr. Frank Tortoris, Frank Zanani, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Gautam Narula, Geer Vanderveld, Gene Stewart, George Harris, Giovanni Russo, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, Howard Vihan, Jacob Kovac, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Pari, James Aspinwall, James Benastia, James Muir, Jason Woolham, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jesse Dacumos, Jesse McNulty, Jim Ratliff, Joe DeSano, Joe Valdez, Joel Thomas Ramos, John Tooley, Juan Almaguar, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman of U.S. Chess, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Pryor, I am Kostya Kovutsky of the Chess Dojo, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Cook, Larry Ryforth, Laura Belyovsky, Macaulay Peterson, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Mark Wilkins, Marco Bulatovich, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Matthias Plock, Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Gobel, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Nigmat Malijanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Queenside Management Limited in Switzerland, Randy Temple, Ricky Grahava, Richard Hallenbach, Richard Tucker, Robert Callahan, Robert Titi, Robert Turner, Rory Coleman, Rory Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott McKinnon, Scott Shepard, Sean Krause, Sebastian Finsterwater, Walter, Sergey Magacon, Seth Ruzicka, Shane Unger, Silver Knights in Richmond, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, FM Timothy Wall, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rattel, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and last but never least, Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we will catch you all next week. Music.